I want to welcome everybody to today's event, uh, tax, uh, Taxing the Gig Economy, sponsored by the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center. I'm Mark Mazur, the uh, Robert C. Posen Director of the Tax Policy Center, and it's my pleasure to kick things off here today. We have two excellent sets of panelists today to discuss how tax policy should be modified to address changes in the workforce of today and tomorrow. And this is not a new issue, as um, Janet Novak, one of our moderators, pointed out in the um, 1990s, BLS did a report on the contingent workforce. And so this is an issue that's been with us for decades, um, but uh, one that's important to, to address for now and, and for, the, for the future. Our first panel is going to feature three different but complementary views on what is often referred to as the gig or platform economy. And our panelists will discuss the size of, of this economy, the scope, and how things uh, may have changed over, over time, giving us a sense of the underlying trends with this, uh, this section of the, of the economy. And then our second panel will focus more on the policy and administrative responses that are appropriate to deal with this changing business landscape. And we have four um, panelists who deal with the administrative and compliance side of the uh, uh, tax um, system um, from distinct perspectives. And they're going to share those persp perspectives with us uh, on, the, on the second panel. I'm hoping for a spirited discussion of the alternatives of what can be pursued and, and what should be pursued. Um, let me take a moment to acknowledge our online audience today, people who are watching from, from afar. I would encourage all of you um, both online and the people here in person, to share your thoughts and observations on social media using the hashtag taxinggig. Uh, and for online viewers, using this hashtag is a way to get your comments and questions into the discussion when we head to the Q&A portion of the, of the program. Um, for those of you here in the audience, when um, it's time for Q&A, I think we'll have a microphone to come around to get you to uh, um, uh, ask your questions. Please use the microphone. It makes it a whole lot easier for people in the online audience to hear what you're, what you're asking. Um, and um, finally, let me offer a, uh, a big thank you to the events team who organized today's discussion, um, Ann Clevin from Tax Policy Center, Anna, Davis, uh, Anna Dawson, and the rest of the Brookings Institution staff who pulled all this together today for, for us. And now what I want to do is invite up the first panel to uh, the stage. Um, our first uh, panel will be moderated by Janet Novak, um, DC Bureau Chief for Forbes, um, and a long-term chronicler and observer of the um, tax, uh, of tax policy. She'll kick off a substantive discussion with Mike Udell from District Economics, Adam Looney from Brookings, and Elaine Mogg from the Tax Policy Center. So we have a terrific panel today, and we're going to start with Mike Udell, who is the founding founder and managing member of the District Economics Group. And Mike started his career at the IRS studying the tax gap, the TCMP, and he spent many years on the Hill, the Joint Committee on Taxation. And I think what he's going to tell us about today is his analysis of the new Bureau of Labor Statistics report that came out in June which suggested that we shouldn't all be here today because the gig economy is not really growing. Mike, you want to head? Great. So um, is this is connected, right? So thanks for, I want to thank uh, Brookings for asking me to come. First of all, uh, we don't have a client in this space, so I don't have a dog in the hunt. 
I think that's a, a useful disclosure here. Uh, we really haven't studied the issue much. We come at it from two different uh, directions. First, the SOI asked us to think a little bit about it, and we asked them to tabulate some information on it for us. And uh, second, in a, in a previous life, uh, I was part of the team that wrote the statute, wrote 6050W, that has created the, probably the reason we're in the room today. So um, I have a little bit of just paternal uh, linkage to the, to the issues. So what the SOI asked us to do uh, was first say, look, we have this new census report. It's trying to measure self-employment. And what can, what, how can you square it with our numbers? So what we decided to do was take two perspectives. We first wanted to say, well, geez, does the census data align with anything in the tax data? And I think the first slide is going to say it probably does. Uh, but it doesn't capture a lot what's in the tax data. And the second thing, which we'll do in the next slides, is we're going to say, well, over the last 20 years, have things really changed in the self-employment space? Uh, so we decided to look at this problem with two different age groups, the youngsters, the people entering the labor force. We're going to look at them. And then the, I used to call them the older folks, but now I'm told that they're the more experienced people. <laughs> so... Um, but this slide, the, the right-hand column is the, most, is the recent data from the new BLS survey on contingent workers. And we compared it with the most recent SOI data, which is two years earlier. But, you know, these are two different surveys trying to measure the same thing. And what you can see in the two rightmost columns is that the BLS survey isn't really all that far off from what the SOI says are self-employed people whose predominant income is self-employment. The, the, the youngsters, BLS says 1.6 million, SOI says 1.7 million. That's pretty close. Uh, the more experienced folks, BLS says 2.4 million, and SOI says 2.3 million. That's, that's pretty close, too. The odd thing, though, is the first column, the one on the left, and that's the number of folks who report some self-employment income, but it's not the primary source. And this is what the BLS survey doesn't really pick up. So you can see there's, these are big numbers. There's 4.2 million youngsters that aren't reporting as self-employed in the BLS data, but they show up on the SOI. And they only show up because they filed a Schedule C. So that's a problem because I think one of the discussions today is going to be, well, geez, maybe a lot of the people aren't even filing a Schedule C who are self-employed. So this is just a, a quick snapshot to say, yeah, SOI and BLS are on the same page if you're looking at your primary source of income. Um, below this, there were a bunch of issues, and we won't talk about them because we've cut for time, but the bottom one, number three, there are a number of tax code sections that are really relevant to create, that created this, uh, the reason we're having a conference. I hope the tax administration folks will talk about it. 6050WE is the information reporting provision. 6721 and 22 are, real, are tax penalties, and they turn out to have a really big impact on why companies are doing what they're doing in this space. We left off section 3406, which is backup withholding, and that's another serious problem for platform or, or gig economy companies. So hopefully those, those provisions will get shown up in the discussion. So which way? Forward? Right. So now we just wanted to say, geez, have things changed much over the last 20 years for youngsters and for people with more experience? And so this is just a frequency count of how many times um, a Schedule C shows up on a tax return. So in the leftmost column in 1995, the top gray bar says 2.9%. 2.9% of youngsters in 1995 had their income predominantly from self-employment. And you'll see that over the 20 years, that grew. All right? And that's actually the one thing this, that really is changing on this whole slide, is that the proportion of youngsters who are predominantly self-employed has grown quite a bit, 2.9% to 4.6% of returns filed by these people. That's, that's pretty good growth. You'll see the maroon bars below it. Those are people who are showing self-employment income, but it's not their predominant self-employment income. And you see there's, there's really not much growth there. Uh, for the experienced folks, the gray bar at the top 
from 1995 to 2015, there's really not much growth there. It's the same proportion of experienced folks who are filing whether they were in 1995 when they were 56 to 65 or 2015 when they were 56 to 65. Same proportion filing uh, predominantly Schedule C. So the takeaway from this slide is, yeah, there's growth of predominantly self-employed people amongst youngsters. And this is to 2015, which really predates the most important moment in the platform space, which happened in 2016. So this, this may become exacerbated uh, in more recent tax return filings. So then we said, OK, how much has income changed on, for these folks? And one of the odd things is if we look on the left side for the young, the young kids, self-employment income as a share of their total income is flat even though there are more youngsters being predominantly self-employed as a share of total income of this cohort, all right, and there's obviously a lot of stuff going on here, but as a share of total income, it hasn't changed at all. And I think this sort of jived with one of the things that the Census Bureau was showing in their data, which was that the average earnings for self-employed people have actually been falling. Um, and so we were, this kind of bears that out that as a share of income, it's not growing, but as a share of people with self-employment income, it's, it's growing. So share, it has to be that the average is falling. For the um, more experienced folks, it grew. That's the best, best of what you can say, all right? And finally, we said, well, geez, has this changed on a per capita basis? Same snapshot. For youngsters in 1995, we, we, these are in real dollars, so we sort of scaled everything. They made 14000 per return uh, of self-employment income. And in 2015, 15000 It's not really much of a growth over 20 years. For the experienced people, there was substantial growth, although it happened pretty much before the Great Recession. Um, and that's, as Diane pointed out, I think, in a blog post that she wrote for uh, District Economics, this is just showing a kind of a life cycle effect that... Uh, people are monetize, experienced people are monetizing their experience and by becoming self-employed. Um, so those were, the, those were the key pictures that we wanted to uh, show, which says, so far, at least through 2015, we don't see any earthquakes happening in the self-employment space on tax returns. We were then asked to quickly think about, well, uh, are we really measuring this stuff? And I, our last comment, uh, the comment we left the SOI meeting with was, this is probably the wrong place to look if you want to figure out how big the gig economy is. It's probably the wrong place. You probably don't want to look at individual income tax returns. What we think you'd want to do is you want to look at the corporate tax returns. These platform companies are corporations. The expenditure for the sell side, which is the Uber driver or the eBay seller, that expense is probably one of their largest single expenditures. It's going to be on their corporate tax return. And it could be a miscellaneous deduction, but if it is, it's going to be itemized. So our suggestion was if you really wanted to sort of gauge the size of this issue space, what you really want to do is take the 100 largest platform companies that are corporations, have the SOI do their editing, and then you want to compare that number, the deduction that Lyft took or Etsy took, the deduction that they took to pay their sellers, you want to go back and compare that to the information returns that they filed. So we know their information returns. They all have a corporate EIN. It's sitting on the 1099s. So if there's this big discrepancy between what we see on the 1099s and what the companies took as a deduction for payments, then that's a pretty strong indicator that the information reporting system is not tracking on the individual side this issue. And that's how we, we left it. Uh, we were raising our hand to tell the SOI we'd be glad to do that project with them. They, uh, so far, they've demurred. <laughs> and that's just what I wanted to talk about. Okay. okay. Our next speaker is Adam Looney, who's now back at Brookings as the uh, director of the Center on Regulation and Markets. But for our purposes, what's crucial is that he was at uh, Treasury as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Office of Tax Analysis. And even more relevant, in 2007, he produced a really 
in-depth look at um, the gig economy and what some of the regulatory and uh, policy issues were, as well as how it big is it really. So I think he'll talk to us about some of those findings. Yes, well, thank you very much. Um, good to be here. Uh, I want to talk a bit about self-employment in general and then the gig economy in particular. Uh, I want to start with self-employment in part because I think a lot of the issues related to the gig economy are ultimately issues about self-employment. And a lot of the, the long-standing tax policy, um, labor regulation, compliance, benefit coverage issues that, that we'll talk about on the second panel um, are issues that are long-standing and, and have been issues that relate to self-employment for a long time. Um, I, I also thought it might be useful to start off very briefly just to, uh, in terms of uh, my study, which was about uh, tax returns and analysis of tax returns, it might be useful to have a brief primer on how uh, gig economy workers and self-employed in general are supposed to file their returns. Uh, so so um, to provide a little color on that, uh, if, for instance, you work for a ride-sharing company like Uber or Lyft, uh, they're supposed to issue you um, a 1099-K often for, uh, the, for the payments for the services that you provide to your, ride sh to your clients. Uh, in practice, the threshold for when the, those companies have to issue those forms is quite high. So it's uh, 200 transactions or uh, $20,000, the greater of, um, uh, of those two. Uh, in practice, for many years, most companies had issued 1099Ks to almost all or all of their ride-sharing partners. Uh, I know that not from looking at the tax data, but from reading like TurboTax's uh, online forums and you know Reddit um, threads maintained by ride-sharing partners who clearly state that like, I got this 1099K, what do I do with it? Well, what you're supposed to do with it is you're supposed to take the information about how much you got, uh, you received in gross receipts from, from Uber. Uh, you're supposed to plug it into your Schedule C when you file your income tax return. Uh, on Schedule C that reports your net income from your sole proprietorship. So you put on the receipts that you uh, receive from them, you subtract any expenses, things like uh, the cost to maintain your car or the standard mileage rate, um, any, any other costs associated with um, providing your, um, your service, like if you offered water bottles to your clients, for instance, you would take a deduction for those. Uh, and then only if you earn $400 uh, in net income from your Schedule C do you file uh, Schedule SE, which is reporting self-employment income. Uh, and so that's a long-winded way to say that, that um, the translation from the number of people who uh, uh, drove a car or participated in the gig economy to those that file uh, and report self-employment income might be, a, might be a big gap between those two. And, and indeed, that, that'll be something that I think we come back to as well. Um, so in our paper, uh, we observed that in, in 2014, there were about 19 million people who had reported income from self-employment. Uh, that was up from about 15 million in the year 2000, so a 25% increase. Uh, a much larger share of people uh, in 2014 had filed Schedule C. So about 25 million people had filed Schedule C, reporting some activity uh, as a sole proprietorship. And so the gap between 25 million and um, the roughly 19 million who had income means that there were a lot of people who did not earn enough income to either earn a profit or to earn at least $400 uh, and therefore did not file a Schedule C, a uh, Schedule SE, excuse me, and have, and have income. And so that's a very big gap, uh, and I think that we'll come back to that because it turns out that there's a lot of people who participate in the gig economy who don't earn quite that much money. Uh, and so uh, a substantial amount of growth over time uh, I think as um, Mike's presentation suggested, a lot of that growth is not among people who, for whom self-employment activities is their primary activity. It was a secondary activity. Uh, and so it's um, relatively smaller and, um, and secondary to their primary uh, job as a W-2 employee. Um, uh, another thing to say is that our study only went through 2014. Uh, that's because the data that we had in hand at that time. Since that time, I think that there has been substantial growth um, beyond that, especially in the gig economy. Uh, and I, I guess I should pause for a second to say, in, in 2014, um, uh, when we looked at self-employment, uh, obviously the number of activities that people participate in, in is quite varied. So there are, there are people who report uh, self-employment earnings from, 
from being a partner in a, uh, a big law firm uh, to people who report self-employment income from being a babysitter or from uh, mowing lawns in the neighborhood uh, or to being a contractor. So there's a wide range of activities. Uh, of that, the gig economy uh, is a small share. So in 2014, uh, when we looked, we saw that there were only about 100,000 people uh, who had reported net, uh, net income and filed Schedule SC reporting self-employment earnings from being a gig worker. Uh, so again, 100,000 people uh, at that time is on the order of 0.1% of the U.S. workforce. Uh, that was also a time when I think that if you looked at um, uh, some ride-sharing companies' public statements, that they were saying that there were 600,000 people who were uh, partners in their platform. So a very large difference between the number of people who are participating to some extent and the number of people who were then filing a return and reporting uh, at least $400 of net income. Uh, I, again, that was for 2014. I think since 2014, uh, there's been very rapid growth. So I think that there are, there are uh, researchers at Harvard, Berkeley, uh, uh, University of Illinois, uh, and the University of Chicago who are working on these issues. Uh, and, and I think that if you ask them, they would find that the number of uh, gig workers who are reporting self-employment earnings has gone up to something like 600,000 uh, 600, people by 2016, so a very rapid growth. Uh, but again, um, probably a growth that in, in secondary employment, not the primary uh, employment. Uh, when we looked at the people who were participating, uh, it was younger people, uh, it was more likely to be men, uh, less likely to be married. Uh, they had relatively low earnings. Uh, I don't think that that's attributed, attributable to the gig economy per se. Um, but just from the fact that they were often uh, using their gig economy work to supplement uh, either having too few hours on their primary job or being between jobs, uh, using it to consumption smooth, for instance, between uh, activities. Um, uh, in terms of their net income, when we looked at how much uh, in 2014 these workers were working, uh, were earning, we, we saw that they earned only about $6,000 from their activity. And that was contingent on um, having um, reported positive uh, net income. So kind of relatively small amounts of money, uh, even conditional on having earned any. And, and then I think if you looked at the, the number of people who engage in the activity, uh, a very large share don't earn enough to be required to file. So something on the order of 40% of uh, gig economy workers seem to have sufficient expenses or, uh, or um, have such small levels of participation that they aren't required to, uh, to file a return. In terms of other characteristics, uh, they were otherwise quite similar to uh, other self-employed workers. So for instance, they had relatively lower rates of coverage from health insurance, about the same rate, 75% coverage rate as, as workers uh, who are self-employed versus a 90% health insurance coverage rate of primarily W-2 workers. Uh, similarly, they were much less likely to uh, contribute to a retirement account. So in the year that we studied, 2014, about 19% of uh, gig economy workies, workers had contributed to any retirement account versus about 45% of uh, workers who had a formal W-2 job. Um, and that's a little bit higher than other self-employed workers, um, but otherwise quite, quite comparable. Um, and so that's a quick overview of, of the population, uh, and I'm, I look forward to our conversation. Um, next is Elaine Mag, and she is a senior research associate at Irving Brookings Tax Policy Center. But what is relevant today is she has some new research. She's just now crunching the numbers on, which is very intriguing because she's using the longitudinal study of youth. And um, Mike has just said that we have, made, have seen some increase in full-time self-employment among youth. So uh, she's going to fill us in on, give us a preview of what her research is showing. Thank you. Um, this morning when I left my house, my very fashion cons conscience, 11 year old daughter said, mom, you look exactly like a serious businesswoman. And I can see, <laughs> except for the blue shirt, I have nailed it. So <laughs> next time I'm going to be even closer. Um, the work that I'm going to talk about, I did with um, Liz Peters, um, Dan Berger and Carrie Lou, who are all um, at the Urban Institute, and 
Um, it's sort of been an ongoing project where we have looked at this in a couple of phases. Um, so the gig economy gets a lot of attention, as we all know. And in some ways, it's really made self-employment um, more visible and more accessible. And that's why it becomes an issue for us. So we've always had um, people babysitting, paying others for rides, performing odd jobs, right? But utilizing platforms such as Lyft, Uber, TaskRabbit, and more have meant that people who would have made these connections in small communities, neighborhoods, churches, friend networks, can now make these arrangements more broadly, which um, pe with people potentially they have no connection to. And it's that interaction that I think defines the gig economy. And as it becomes more visible, it's natural to think it's a really important thing that's going on and something we should um, be thinking about. But yet, um, there's a data that's saying it's really not that, you know, big yet, but maybe it's growing. But beyond potentially um, making the gig economy bigger, the platforms have also um, potentially driven activity that used to be sort of underground and informal into the above ground economy. So because I like to think about tax administration a little bit, that's probably good news for the IRS. At least someone has some data out there and the question is, can they get it? So once the um, gig economy became more visible, it raised the issues that Adam and Mike have already talked about. And they have to do with, you know, which, la which laws does everyone have to follow? And the ones I'm most interested in are um, not the labor laws necessarily, but the tax side of it. So to sort of understand where the tax side is coming from, we want to understand um, if we've seen this big increase in the gig economy or if it's becoming more prominent, do we think that's going to continue? Because if it's a temporary phenomenon, it's not a, a big issue for the IRS. It, they might have already passed it. Um, but if we think it's going to continue, then it's something they um, should start to be really concerned about. And my argument would be that from earlier work, I think it's going to continue. And that's because of a phenomenon that a lot of people are talking about, which is income volatility. So there was some work done here at Brookings that shows that over time, incomes have become much more volatile year over year. And then work that I did um, with my colleagues at Urban show that even over the course of the year, incomes are very volatile. And of course, the gig economy um, provides an answer to that volatility. It's a very low entry way to do some income smoothing. So to just sort of scale the issue, there are um, half of all working age adults and almost two thirds of all low income working age adults have at least one month in the year when their income spikes or dips 25% above or below their average. So this is a big change that's happening. And nearly 40% of low income workers um, have household income that's doing this spiking or dipping in six months of the year. So people are just experiencing a tremendous amount of volatility. And it's natural that they would look for ways to sort of smooth this. Um, what we tried to tease out is, is self-employment smoothing that volatility, or is it the reason for that volatility? And we do find that um, people who rely on self-employment income have the most volatile incomes. They are the ones whose incomes are just bouncing around, you know, sometimes every month. It's very difficult to predict what's happening. But in the case where people get about a quarter of their income from self-employment, the story is very different. Their incomes are still more volatile than your um, wage earner, someone who's relying exclusively on wages. But it's not that much of a difference. So in, in some ways, the gig economy is working as we expect it to. When you mix wages and self-employment, your income is smoother. So then um, what we wanted to look at in our current project is um, look at um, workers from who were surveyed starting in 1979 compared to workers who are surveyed in starting in 1997. And we break them up into two groups. We look at young workers, which kind of overlap Mike's definition, at least 23 to 27 year old types. But then we have mid-career workers also who are 30 to 34. And we don't have older workers in that because our- Experienced. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm under Thank 55, you. so uh, <laughs> I can still say older. <laughs> We don't, have, we don't have that piece of the pie because um, the folks who started getting interviewed in 1997 simply haven't um, reached that point in their career. Um, so we find several things that I want to talk about. The first is that um, 
People who are self-employed in one year or receive some income from self-employment are extremely likely to receive self-employment income in another year. And that's important for tax administration because there's some sense of if the IRS can find you once and teach you how to fill out these forms and you're likely to have that obligation year over year, then that's something the um, IRS can work with and people can learn how to comply with the tax law. So that's probably good news. So it used to be in my older um, group, the ones that started being interviewed in 1979, about half of them would report self-employment year over year. And then when they're, as they age, those numbers increase. But by the time we're a little bit more um, current, so my 1997 cohort, again, about half of my young people report um, year over year self-employment, but almost three quarters of this older group. So they're really settling into um, some sort of self-employment that's going to be um, coming into the household every year. Um, men are more likely to be self-employed. And if they're self-employed in one year, they're really likely to be self-employed in another year. And um, this you know, is important because of clients. And then the final issue is that if you mix self-employment income, um, we also observe that if you're in this older group, you're really likely to be mixing it um, in a second year. So coupled with the fact that these platforms have some information and that people are um, experiencing these same sorts of income types year over year, I think that's potentially good news for the IRS. Um, so the other thing we find is that um, there's a lot of differences in women and men who are self-employed. And one is that women who are self-employed tend to have children. Um, they tend to um, um, be mid-career. And this looks a lot like other populations. And they tend to have um, quite low incomes. And this looks like other populations the IRS deals with. And those are folks claiming the earned income tax credit and um, child tax credits. And so here's an opportunity for the IRS to be thinking about a group that they're touching with one program, potentially touching um, from another angle. So I think that's also you know, some good news for the IRS. So overall, my sense is we're just really starting to get a handle on what's going on in this new gig economy. We're um, kind of having old issues come to the front. But I think that to the extent that these platforms are going to serve the function of being consolidators um, of people's labor, then it's probably something that um, hopefully the IRS can you know, find a way to work with them and figure out the <laughs> compliance side. Well, that's really, those are all very interesting presentations which tell us a lot and also how much we don't know. So after listening to the three of you and reading the work you've produced, um, there are three things that jump out at me. One is that the gig economy is larger than the BLS would tell us, but a lot smaller than the media hype from us and other people would, would suggest that it's growing and you know, we push it. Um, the second is that most of the policy concerns, health and retirement benefits and tax compliance, are not new. They've been around and they were studied back in the Clinton administration. And the third is that a lot of the platform work that we now call gig work is really producing, particularly on an after expense basis, if you think of the, Uber, the Ubers of the world, very small amounts of income. So if I take those one, two, three points, then what, what, what the question I'm left with is, if much of the growth in self-employment is moonlighting, setting aside this, this younger cohort that a greater percentage are now working as self-employed. Um, are there really any new issues we need to worry about? Or are they the same old issues um, of benefits coverage and misclassification of workers, which I believe, Adam, your paper said a lot of the growth you believe to be misclassification. But are th what new issues, or is it just the same issues with maybe a little bit of um, more hype and reason to pay attention because of the potential of the gig economy? And I wanted you all to address that. Um, you, you want me to jump in? Yeah. Um, so I, I guess the, the first thing to say is um, the employer-employer relationship is very important for a wide variety of um, employer-provided benefits, for tax compliance, uh, and for 
uh, labor regulations. So the fact that your employer gives you a W-2 that re that, uh, and withholds taxes makes you much more likely to file a return, makes you much more likely to be compliant with the tax system, uh, um, and uh, makes you much more likely to, to file the taxes you're due. Uh, similarly, we, we provide a lot of uh, employer benefits like health insurance coverage, uh, 401k retirement coverage, uh, through the employer-employer relationship. And so that is a, a primary de um, delivery mechanism for those benefits. And then finally, there are a whole a uh, number of ancillary other issues that we, we address um, through the employer-employer relationship. Those are things like the minimum wage, uh, health and safety regulation, anti-discrimination rules. Um, and, and so it, it is an important institution, and, I, and the, the longstanding um, you know, policy battle has been about how to define that relationship uh, and how to, to deal with cases where the employer-employee relationship is ambiguous uh, or where employees or employees uh, want to um, divest themselves from that relationship. Uh, and so those are, in some ways, longstanding issues. Um, I, I think that they, uh, their importance has increased and, and, grow and, and shrunk over time. Uh, it seems like a time today where um, the availability of online platforms has, has made it easier to kind of divest from the traditional relationship. Um, uh, it's an issue that I think that is important for federal policymakers, but it's also one that's um, being litigated in a wide variety of areas. So, uh, you know, internationally, I think uh, the gig economy and certain cities have taken on this relationship and, and suggested that, that um, ride-sharing drivers, for instance, are employees. Uh, that's an issue that's been um, uh, being litigated in, in cities and states across America as well to some some degree. Um, so I, I think it is an important issue uh, and it's very central to to how we offer all these types of benefits and, and monitor compliance with the rules. So your suggestion is that the platforms make it easier to divest the employee relationship, but Elaine is suggesting that the platforms may also make it easier for us to track who is doing this unsavory divestment and to perhaps um, require them to help us uh, with tax compliance. And, and uh, yeah, so let, yeah. Me, let, me, let me chime in, because that's a yin and a yang, OK? And so the, uh, the yin is, as Elaine says, look, the platforms have reduced transactions costs so that people can jump into economic activities with much, much less expensive. You can one minute be on a couch and the next minute you can be in your car as a transportation driver, whether you're delivering for Amazon or you're driving for Uber or what. So the transactions costs that the platforms have created is just so low that people are now being pulled onto the platforms to do the job. Um, that's the yin, I guess that's the good news. The yang is that the tax system has a flaw in it, I'm part of the flaw, um, and that is that Conventionally, these people would, everyone working on a platform would fall under a tax code provision that said if you're paid $600 or more in a year, whoever's paying you, in this case the platform, would, would write you a 1099. I write a 1099 to my landlord. I write a 1099 to my accountant. 6050W has this giant safe harbor sitting in there. It says, nah, it's $20,000 and 200 transactions. And so these, this $600 threshold and this $20,000 threshold are really the entire tension. And the platforms, everyone is driving into the $20,000 safe harbor because there's a letter ruling that came out in 2016 that said, yes, go ahead. If you're a platform business, the people you're paying, if they're not employees, they get this special $20,000 safe harbor. So what's happened, or we think it's happening, because we don't know quite yet, um, is that these people simply aren't getting any information that shows up at the IRS. They're getting information from the platform about what they did, and very detailed information, which is quite an opportunity for tax administration. But that information isn't necessarily getting to the Treasury because it's not hitting the $20,000 threshold. That's a serious compliance problem, not only for the income tax, but it's also really the payroll tax. It's really shortchanging the people who are providing labor on the platforms because we're not, they're not contributing to the payroll tax system. 
let alone unemployment, et cetera, the other traditional employer things that the costs the employers take. This payroll tax system is probably being really shortchanged here. It's just that's an opinion. I don't know if it's a fact. So I think you have these two forces going on that are that are in tension. And the twenty thousand dollar threshold, the safe harbor, is really something that needs to be resolved. It can't sit on the tax code next to a six hundred dollar reporting threshold. That's in, there's an inconsistency there that needs to be addressed. Right, but if you do take the opportunity to address it, right, the information's all there and available. It's not going to be more burdensome for any of these companies to produce the information. So it seems like we're at least a legislative stone's throw away from, you know, <laughs> fixing the issue instead of being completely in the dark like we used to be with self-employment. No, that's right. I think the platforms, the, the, the you know, some of the breakthrough in the platforms is They've got all the content on all the information, so they've reduced, not only have they reduced the transactions costs for people to provide labor into the economy, which is a huge plus, but they've also reduced the transactions cost of what used to be traditional HR functions. It's all in the back room. If I'm going to drive on Uber, I don't go anywhere. I do, it, I do it all on the platform. The entire HR function is on the platform. If the platforms are evolving that way, and for example, Handy does a lot of background checks on their platform, you don't, the, trans, the platforms are actually capable of providing a tremendous tax administration, I would call it an agency relationship. They, they have the information, it's electronic. But so, they, they don't have the information about your expenses if you're an Uber driver, which, it, which is part of the problem. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a stone's throw for the transportation companies to actually populate a Schedule C. It's just a stone's throw because we, the service has a mileage charge. The platforms know exactly how much miles you, you, uh, you drove. It's very, it, it, it may not be net income at the end of the day because of other expenses that they can't see through, but this is really much, this is so much closer to net income than gross proceeds reporting. And that has been the big evolution in, in tax information reporting is, going from gross proceeds down to net income. So, you know, when we did 6050W, it's a gross proceeds reporting mechanism. But the platforms have a lot of information, not all of them, about the deductions that ought to, ought to flow. So what we would need, I mean, information reporting generally only gets passed within the context of a deficit reduction package, right? because it's not popular. So we would need some kind of a package where it gets slipped in. That's right, they need the revenue. That's right, so just... And since we have big deficits, that's positive, right? right. I don't know if this is gonna solve that problem. Right. Um. Let me ask you something that um, is gonna sort of be contrarian. I mean, we, we traditionally have looked at, at um, self-employment and we said, well, some people wanna do it, but other people are pushed into it. Um, I'm wondering whether the percentage of people who want to do it may be rising for a couple of reasons. One is that with the um, uh, demise of defined benefit pensions, well, all you get anyway is a 401k and you can save for yourself with a 401k. The second is if the Affordable Care Act survives, there's a way to get health insurance. And the third, of course, is with the new tax law, section 199A, there is a real tax advantage to being self-employed. Plus, there's a different, I think, I have all these millennial writers who work for me, a different attitude towards employers versus self-employment. So do you see any evidence or do you have any thoughts on whether uh, the, the desirability of self-employment may be rising and, and that that could, in fact, mean we'll have more of it. I mean, so I, I, I agree with everything you said, and I, I do think it, it becomes more attractive over time. So the, the Affordable Care Act in particular, I, by decoupling health insurance benefits to some degree, to a large degree, from the employer relationship uh, was very important. And so in, in my in the work that I um, quoted from earlier, it looked like 11% of gig workers in 2014, the first year of the ACA, were being covered by marketplace coverage. Uh, I think that that number has probably doubled uh, just because overall uh, marketplace coverage more than doubled in the, in the subsequent year. 
Um, so I think a very large share of gig economy workers are using the marketplace uh, and, and benefiting from that. I think that is an important way of um, providing coverage to that group. I think it makes it more attractive to, to engage in a non-traditional um, employment activity like self-employment. Uh, we've kind of already done a lot of that for retirement coverage uh, where people can, if they want to, go out and sign up with Fidelity or some um, brokerage to, to have a, a, an IRA or something like that. Uh, and then I think certainly 199A uh, makes it more attractive to be self-employed uh, rather than being an employee just because you get a, a very large ex uh, exclusion from um, your income for, um, for, for that. And then, uh, you know, I, I wish I could speak to the uh, attitudes and impressions of the millennials. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know that I'm well positioned to do that. Uh, but I do think that there is some flexibility offered by this, and, and, and people enjoy that. So I, 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 and then I guess the other thing to say is that it certainly is growing quickly. And so there are a lot, of, a lot more people who participate in these platforms and who use them um, um, to supplement their, their other income. So it is clearly an, a very active area and growing quickly. Although, as we've been saying, the platforms may be consolidating the kind of informal work people were doing before, right? Yeah, and I think yeah. also expanding their... Yeah, I mean, definitely. You know, if it, if it used to be your kind of local <coughs> groups and your, your, the network that you could drive yourself, suddenly there's a, a whole city or uh, a local area that's available to you to, to market to, in effect. Mm -hmm. when, um, this is... I'm, I apologize, I'm a news person. This is an on-the-news question. When we talk about the policy failings, Adam, we talk a lot about retirement. And yesterday, the Bureau of the Department of Labor came out with a suggestion that they would let um, independent contractors join these multi-employer organizations for the purposes of 401ks. And I was left with the question of why we have IRAs, we have SEPs, we have solo 401ks. What we don't have is um, automatic enrollment or the, maybe the spare cash to contribute. Do you think that this makes any difference? Is this a policy solution or is it just window dressing? Um, I, I mean, so my, my impression is that a lot of the challenge that people have saving for retirement is, is having the cash to save um, uh, and, and a nudge perhaps from their employer to, to encourage it. Um, so I think that there is something to, uh, you know, having an employer that automatically enrolls you or that provides you a nudge to, to enroll. Uh, and you don't necessarily get that from, you know, being self-employed. And, and beyond, beyond a nudge, you have to kind of very actively seek out a, uh, a provider. So I can see that being a barrier. Um, but at, at the end of the day, I think a lot of the problems we have with uh, retirement coverage are not about um, people, you know, I think they're about people not having the income uh, to save and, and the pocket money. So in some ways, I think that those those uh, those types of efforts to make them more available uh, or to nudge people are intrinsically limited. Um, Elaine and Mike, both of your research shows that seems to suggest that more of the younger cohort are persisting in self-employment. So the question is that could that be an artifact of the Great Recession? Or are your numbers from such years that it is not that? So the years that we're looking at right now, we specifically avoided the recession years because we were concerned that we'd get an artificially high number. Um, I think that absolutely, it had to have happened, right? When the regular jobs go away, you still need income, you still have expenses. It's, I think it's natural you would look to places to plug those holes. Yeah. No, I thing? would agree. So I mean, we, we just got very lucky in our data 1995, 2005, and 2015, if you think about where they are in the business cycle, all three of those years are in the upswing part of the business cycle. So we were just lucky that we were able to use the, uh, those kind of years. So I, I, I don't think we had the, the Great Recession effect, although there is a Great Recession effect in terms of income of the experienced people. It's simply flatlined between 2005 and 2015 uh, from self-employment activity. So, you know, the Great Recession clearly has changed earnings quite a bit, but at least in our data, uh, we, we got good, good data points because they're in a similar part of the business cycle. Um, but I do want to go back to the, the, the individual and the 401k or the SEP IRA problem. 
One of the things that's happened in the tax code is originally for self-employed persons, we would pay our, and I'm self-employed, we would pay our estimated taxes quarterly. Our, our employees, they get their estimated taxes paid only with every paycheck. And originally that structure was set up because it's burdensome for the self-employed person. Well, we know from tax compliance that self-employed people have pretty poor tax compliance. It shouldn't be lost on people that with the platforms, we could actually flip a lot of this problem on its head and solve it. It is administratively burdensome for the self-employed to do these activities because they have to do them themselves. We have to pay our estimated taxes. We have to put away money, and we have to do it in a lumpy way. To the extent that self-employed people are now earning their labor income on platforms, there's no reason that a platform could not do all those activities. They have all the information. And so from a tax compliance burden perspective, the platforms actually offer a tremendous opportunity to address some of the non-compliance problems of the self-employed. The platforms can withhold. They've got, all the, they've got the money. They've got the, the data. The platforms could contribute to some kind of a savings plan. They have all the money. I, we don't have a client in the space. So I'm, not, I'm just saying that in the older days, all that burden sat on the sole proprietor. I had to do it, all right? And I'm terrible at filling out a quarterly estimated tax payment because it's scary because it's so, it gets so large. But for my employees, they, they don't even notice it because it comes out like every paycheck. I mean, maybe they do notice it, but, uh, but it comes out every paycheck. And so I'm doing their compliance burden. So in a sense, we've got the tax administration system sort of upside down with respect to self-employed. They are the burdened group right now. I think we should be going to the audience for questions. Sorry. Does anybody? Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Christina Fitzpatrick from AARP. And I have a question about data. Um, we are trying to get a grasp on what we are talking about here, about the gig economy, how big it is, how much it's growing. We have IRS data. We have um, current population survey data. And I'm wondering what we know um, on the individual uh, survey side about how people who are self-employed, who are doing this gig work, how they identify. So when you ask them, are you self-employed? What do they say? And for all these other questions, as researchers, we have to interpret what they're saying. And we don't know, I don't know, what they're thinking about and how they respond to these questions. So is somebody looking at that? And what do you know about it? So I think there was a paper that came out pretty recently that says people aren't really good at reporting their self-employment on these surveys. So I, you know, it seems like we're most certainly undercounting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I agree. So I, I think that there are, there are different kinds of errors that people make. So I think there are some people who, who um, in, interpret their relationship as an employer-employee relationship. And so they, they, even if um, a ride-sharing company suggests that they're self-employed, they might still put down their, their income as wages or report that they are an employee. Uh, and so that certainly happens. And I think there's also people who... Um, make the mistake the other way. So, uh, but although I think the primary way is to 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 think that you're an employee, even if you're you're filing as self-employed, uh, and so that's part of the divergence. So you see a divergence between the tax records and the CPS in terms of in terms of the number of people who um, report being self-employed. There's more um, self-employed tax filers than there are respondents who say that they are self-employed. Didn't Catherine Abraham's paper kind of look at this and find that some of the people who tell um, the surveyors that their employees really probably are, but their employers don't treat them as such. Therefore, they have one source of income on that Schedule C, and they don't necessarily have a lot of employee expenses. So, you know, they're going to work and they're told what to do. It's so they don't consider themselves self-employed, but for tax purposes, they're treated as self-employed. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so that would be. And again, it's a complicated. I, I don't remember how many questions are in the test of whether you're an employee or a contractor, but it is a very long facts and circumstance um, test. And it, it, the IRS has not been is, able to issue guidance since the 70s. 78, yes. Yeah, 78. They were told, don't do anything new on this. Yeah. Yeah. 
Ken Simonson with Associated General Contractors. Very interesting data and analysis of it. I'd, I'd like to see this three years from now because I'm wondering, is this a phenomenon of the business cycle and specifically the level of employment or of age groups? So are these 25 to 35-year-olds likely to transition out of uh, doing gig work? Are the uh, people in the 55 to 65 age class as they leave paid employment, are they likely to do more gig work themselves? And also as uh, wages or compensation start to accelerate as we seem to be seeing in the last few months, will that draw more people away from doing gig work and into uh, wage paid work? And so I wonder if any of you want to speculate on those things. So I think those are really interesting questions and that's one of the reasons we're using the National Longitudinal Survey because we can, you know, look over someone's, you know, entire career and we have a pretty long horizon. We're not going to be able to answer for 2018 because we don't have those data. Um, but that's the next step in the research. So we've sort of got the data so we can look year over year and now we're going to daisy chain it all together so we can look over someone's entire career. So that's a great suggestion and, you know, it'll be in the paper. <laughs> Anyone else have yeah. Kim Rubin, Tax Policy Center. And this might be a question that is better served in the next panel, but I at least want to push you guys a little bit on it. So I, I believe all your conversations about why it is easy for platforms to collect this information and give it to the IRS. But I am also guessing that the platforms really don't want to do it. Like, there is a reason that they like having a $20,000 limit and the safe harbor views. Um, can you give your perspectives on both why you think that this is something that is not onerous on them and also what reasons you think they would give for why they shouldn't have this responsibility? And then we'll ask it again in the next panel. Uh, can I? So... Just let me, let's give a little background here. So the statute was written in 2007, right when the iPhone came out, but before the App Store came out. So we didn't have platforms. Well, we had eBay, okay? And so the entire reason that the $20,000 safe harbor is in there is the following. If you go to a flea market, if you were the IRS and you started walking around a flea market and said, I want to see that income reported on your tax return, Right? The IRS doesn't do that. Right? But if you actually said, I want to see that income, and the person sat down and calculated what they earned in the flea market, and then they subtracted cost of goods sold, in most cases, the net income would be zero. Right? So when people are emptying out their attic and they're selling it in the flea market, there's no income there for the tax system. So along comes eBay. And all, it, eBay is based, was a nationwide flea market. I mean, that's the way to think about it, all right? Yes, there were a whole bunch of big overstock sellers selling their computers, but at the lower tail end where the bulk of the participants were, it was a nationwide flea market. And so we realized very quickly that if we required 6041 Cap A reporting, $600 of gross proceeds for people who were selling stuff on eBay, and if we flooded the system with those 1099 documents, and the IRS put that into a document matching program, which is the entire reason to have an information return, they would be overwhelmed with what we would call false positives. They would see a gross proceeds on a 1099. They would shoot out a, 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 a nasty gram, some CP notice that says, you owe us $1,000 times your, your tax rate, pay up. And in fact, there was no income at all. So we realized that if that were to happen, what the IRS would do is they would pull the plug on that, ten, that Form 1099. They would not set that system up. The 1099s would end up on a transcript, and if you were audited, it would show up there, but it would, know, it would be useless to the system. So the $20,000 safe harbor came in because as a rough justice to figure out how to prevent the tax administrator from being overwhelmed with really bad information. And so $20,000 was sort of the threshold where we thought, yeah, you're, you're in a trade or business above that, and you're emptying out your attic below that. That's how the safe harbor came about. So it was for the sale of goods. When we wrote the statute, the word and services showed up because goods and services never are uh, uh, separated. They're like twins. 
in the tax code. So you don't have a statute that says just goods. So in drafting, it was goods and services. This is before the App Store showed up. Now all the services came on the platform, and they said, well, we fit that. And there's a now a letter ruling out there that says, yeah, you do. And so everyone's driving through that $20,000 safe harbor. But for labor services, there's income. It may not be very big, but there's income. And so this is, this is the problem that got created. I mean, can I yeah, say please. one other thing? So, I mean, I, I think that the, the ultimate challenge in, in tax compliance is that you're, you're spending real resources to affect a transfer from the taxpayer to the government. And um, the question is, how much, um, how much of, the, of the pie are you burning by trying to promote compliance? And so in this case, it seems like the, uh, unlike other cases of general contractors, for instance, um, where it might be very costly to to require reporting of how much you paid somebody. Um, here, it seems like it's, it's maintained in the database. Uh, it's fairly accessible. Um, it's inexpensive to provide this information. The companies have, for many years, already pro provided it for every, uh, every person on their platform, down to like small dollar amounts. Uh, and they also provide it to their employees um, in, in the reporting. So a lot of that information is already available. I think on the other side of it, though, that, it, that the IRS, I think, hasn't got a good sense of how they can use the information. I think there are some people who do get the CP notices saying, like, I see that you have $8,000 of gross receipts. You owe me $5,000 or something with penalties. Uh, I think that's a surprise to, their, to the clients of these companies. Uh, I think it's a waste of time um, when ultimately they do file a return saying, well, you know, actually, I was, I was a driver and I didn't have that much income. So I think there's, there's some sorting out. I don't know that the optimal level of reporting is zero or necessarily even $600, but I, I imagine they can probably do a better job uh, of providing information. And then the platforms are resistant to doing this because they don't want to be considered employers because they don't want to pay the employer taxes and, yeah. you know, that side. And maybe because they can get away with paying people less net if those people aren't reporting and don't have tax obligations, yeah. you know. That's factor. I think we have a really interesting question from that came in online about the bifurcation of the self-employment market. Because Mike, your numbers show that among the 55 to 65 year olds, the older people with their human capital, their earnings per self-employed person are actually going up. Whereas we see in the younger self-employed group who may be doing some of the task rabbit or pickup work, that their uh, average earnings seem to be going down. So are we seeing a bifurcation in this self-employment market between high-skilled knowledge workers and people who are just responding to what the platform asks of them for that hour? And do we need to have different policy or tax approaches based on that? Uh, I, I, I think that these are the tale of two cities. Um, for the, for the uh, experienced folks, I don't think they're really that much on the platforms. I could be wrong. But when you're earning average $39,000 uh, self-employment income, that's not typical platform kind of net income. Uh, the experienced folks are monetizing their, their, their life cycle effects. They're monetizing their professional experience. The younger folks, this is actually the census, Catherine Abraham's paper is really good at this. Um, what we think is happening is, is that there's just a, an, an increasing number of young people moving onto the platforms. And what's happening is, is that they're sort of moving down the supply curve and they're earning less and less and less. And so average earnings are falling just because they're adding more and more people who are only working 10 hours a month, all right? And that's because the beauty of the platforms is the transactions costs are so low. So it's easy to hop in. And I, I think that the average earnings number can be a bit of a misnomer because it's, it's belying the distributional change that's going on. It's not that all of a sudden people are earning less. It could be that the, the hard if there's such a word as a hardcore Uber or Lyft driver, someone who's really d working at it, their earnings may even be going up. It's just that because transactions costs have reduced, access to the platforms has, is encouraging people to join. And we're getting a big tail of people working a little bit. And we see in the NLSYR 
older group of workers in the more recent data, um, men seem to be raise, um, earning more. Women seem to be, you know, that 25th percentile tail is getting smaller and smaller. So people, low earners are earning even less if you're a woman. Did you have something you wanted to add? Oh, no, I think that was, they covered it. Well, we're almost out of time, so I'm going to ask if any of you had something you wanted to add that I kind of glossed over or that has come up in our discussion. I'm good. <laughs> Is there anyone with a burning question? Okay, we have time for one burning question. Excuse me, uh, Gerald Chandler, I'm not sure it's burning, but I'm, I'm sure of your definitions. Uh, gig economy and platform economy are not exactly the same, and if we look at the traditional gig in, uh, people, which are doctors and lawyers, are you including them? I mean, so I, I'm thinking primarily of those who are on the online platforms. And I mean, I, I feel like they're, uh, and, and even more than that, I'm usually thinking of people who are providing services through the platform. So like drivers and, um, and workers, not necessarily even like the Airbnb or VRBO types. Mm -hmm. And then the, no, the original, um, no, that, that term has been expropriated from, yes. I think, the gig economy of before where it was kind of, um, you know, a, a much broader class of, uh, of workers. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think Catherine Abraham actually had a really nice little comment in one of her papers that she thinks, and I'm going to trust her, that gig came from a gig, from a session musician showing up, and a gig was a one-off, a one piece. All right, it's a you did one job, you did one product, and you handed it, and that was done. You were done with that relationship. I really think gig is a misnomer here. These are the whole discussion is about platforms. Everything is really about platforms. Yeah. So ours does in the NLSY. We're looking, you know, we have some very wealthy people, and we had thought about should we be treating them differently in the analysis. Um, right now we sort of look at people at different points in the income distribution because we think the issues are probably a little bit different for, uh, you know, someone making $4,000 a year versus $90,000 a year. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much. That was very great. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.